Good evening, everyone. I'm Carol Merchart. I'm the Access Executive Director, and I want to welcome you to tonight's webinar. Really appreciate your coming to join us for this wonderful presentation to learn about the NAI study on X and Y chromosome variations and hear the experiences over the last two decades with the latest clinical findings and future plans. This is brought to you by Axis. We are the Association for X and Y Chromosome Variations. And you can visit us 24 hours a day at genetic.org. I encourage you to come take a look at our website. There's all sorts of resources about all of the different conditions, the latest research we post on our website, and information about our support group. You can contact us at any time via our PO box. Our toll-free number we'd like you to know is also a helpline. So for anyone who has questions, please feel free to call that line and we connect you with a trained volunteer who will then get your answers to any kind of questions about our X and Y variations. And you can also do that via email. We have a clinic consortium we'd like you to know about. We've worked together with some of the best pediatric and adult clinics in 10 different cities right now. There's a list of them on our website at genetic.org slash clinic. And we're happy to help refer you to the health professionals who can help you. We hold support groups in many places throughout the United States, and we're always looking to start new support groups. So please visit our website to see where the support groups are and when the next meetings will be. We also want you to know that some of those support groups are virtual to answer your questions 24-7. Access is a nonprofit, and all your donations are tax deductible. So we always really encourage your support and we greatly appreciate it. I wanna personally invite you to our 2019 Family Conference, which is going to be held June 28th to 30th in Atlanta. Visit our website for more information. We're going to be there. We're gonna be opening registration in just a few days. And our speaker tonight is going to be at our conference, and so many of the researchers that you have read their scientific papers will be there at the conference, along with families, so you can really gain a great support network. So right now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Ar Armin Rasahan, who is from NIH, and he's going to be sharing his research with us tonight. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Rasahan. Many thanks, Carol. Many thanks uh, for the invitation, and, and thank you all for coming and being part of uh, the webinar this evening. Um, really happy to to be here, and and thankful to Access for all the work they do, and, and the great leadership in providing a, a community space to bring uh, to bring families, clinicians, and researchers together. Uh, so, just a bit of background. I, I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist and a, a neuroscientist, and I. I lead a multidisciplinary team here at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, just outside Washington, DC. And XY variations are a major focus of our work. Uh, now, the, the NIH study on XY variations has been running in Bethesda for almost uh, two decades. And I wanted to take this opportunity to provide a sort of overview today uh, of our experiences over this time. And uh, as Carol was saying, some re recent clinical findings and future plans. Now, it's important to stress that although this talk will be uh, largely focusing on work from the study that's been going on here, uh, as you heard in the earlier slides, there are really a number of other teams that also uh, focusing on cognitive and behavioral development uh, in XY variations, including groups at Stanford, Denver, and Philadelphia. Uh, and it's great to, to see that there's a sort of emerging uh, collaborative links between uh, between all of us. So that's really exciting too. So what I thought I'd try to do uh, in the, um, trying to make sure these slides progress okay. Um, see if this works, sorry about this. Great, so I thought I'd try to um, organize this talk around some, uh, some questions that I imagined uh, the community might have but critically, I want to be very open to any questions you have. So please feel free to, to type your questions as we're going, um, and I'll be pausing to address those as we go. I've also got a kind of mini break slide in the middle where we can pause for a sort of some discussion before we go on to the second half of the talk. So um, some questions that I thought would be, would be important to go through are 
you know, how did the study come about and who's on the study team, just to provide you some context. What's, what, what are you trying to achieve will be a question you might very reasonably ask us. Uh, what does the study involve? Uh, what have been the key outputs from your research? Uh, what are your future plans and how can I get more information? And uh, critically, as I said, uh, feel free to ask anything else uh, as we go along. So um, how did the study come about and who's on the study team? Well, oh, I, this, I see this hasn't uh, come through. Oh, here we are. So um, for some reason, this slide's not uh, working. But the, the study was initiated in, uh, if somebody could text or write a comment in to confirm that they're seeing this OK, uh, that would be great. Uh, so the study was initiated in 1990 by Dr. Jay Geed, who I'm sure many of you know of, uh, and it's been based at the National Institute of Mental Health uh, since. And the first phase of the study ran 1990 to 2010, and that was really focused on cognitive development and, uh, and, and brain anatomy. Um, and there were overall about 150 participants who were seen between ages 5 and 25 from a range of XY variation groups that I'm showing here. Uh, the the uh, current phase of the study began in 2015, uh, based at uh, my group, the Developmental Neurogenomics Group at the NIMH. And this had a number of real key goals that were kind of informed by the early phase of work. And we wanted to kind of step forward and intensify the research in a number of key directions. These included getting deeper and wider behavioral assessments to, to allow for better clinical feedback and inform the science we do, to gather a bit more information about first degree relatives of, uh, of uh, individuals with XY variations and how XY variations can affect day to day functioning. We also wanted in this new phase of the study to gather more detailed measures, not just the brain structure, but also brain function and the physical development. And critically, since the first phase of the study, there had been these massive advances in our capacity to measure genetic uh, genome structure and function and to understand how genetic factors might be operating in XY variation. So this new phase of the study incorporates many of these new technologies, and I'll be alluding to those a bit later on. And finally, we wanted to expand the scale of the study significantly. So we aim to see over three times the size of participants in the earlier phase. And that's really important for understanding how indiv different individuals with an XY variation can vary from each other. You need large sample sizes to kind of properly characterize the variation in strengths and weaknesses that one can, one can see. So that's the sort of background of the study. Who's on the NIH variation study team? Well, the short answer is a lot of people. It's a multidisciplinary t uh, team. Uh, and many of you, I'm sure, have interacted with uh, Jonathan Blumenthal, the research coordinator. Erin Torres is a specially trained uh, mental health nurse. And Lee Clarson, who's a psychologist and data manager. We have um, an excellent uh, collaboration with the specialist uh, autism uh, assessment and treatment team at the Children's Medical Center, Lauren Kenworthy, Shrishti Rao, and um, Marissa Miller. And it's myself, Siwon Liu, and Francois Lalonde are uh, comp com computer engineers and data scientists. And then, you know, we have this team, and, and many of these faces will be uh, familiar to folks who come through the study, of trainee clinicians and scientists. And I think one of the really uh, important issues that we have an eye on in the future is generating interest and expertise and enthusiasm about uh, clinical work and research in XY variations. Because the more we can do to kind of grow the population of people that are interested in understanding and, and helping families with XY variations, the better we're going to do further down the line. And, and we work, our team works very closely with a large network of collaborators across North America and, and, and Europe. So that's some context of the study. So what are we trying to achieve? Well. Simply put, you know, our overarching goal, like many working in this field, is to try to use data to advance clinical care in XY variations. And what I wanted to do here was to frame our goals uh, with re in, in the context of things we hear from families who come through the study. Uh, and these are aspects of clinical care that we hope 
that our data will help to uh, improve or advance. And, and I'm sure many of you have this experience of you know, having to tell the doctor what an, the XY variation uh, that affects your family is. So sort of educating the clinicians. These conditions are relatively infrequent uh, and often um, um, educators, primary care uh, practitioners uh, and pediatricians may not be overly familiar with these conditions. So there's that hurdle of connecting with someone who's had access to, uh, to good quality information about XY variations. And then there are questions about uh, how one can predict the future or help to target treatments. You know, what can we do to support our child's development? What steps can we take now that are going to help things down the line? If we're faced with two treatments, should we consider treatment X or treatment Y? Does the fact that um, our son or daughter has an XY variation and ADHD, does that mean something for how we should treat the ADHD or should we just use uh, current uh, treatments for ADHD that aren't sort of tailored? Uh, is there information that helps to tailor this to ADHD in the context of XY variation? And then there are the sort of why questions, the mechanistic questions, you know, why are these developmental difficulties occurring in my child who has an XY variation? What, what's happening at the level of, of biology? And is there a kind of test, an objective test, a lab test, for example, that we could potentially take early on to help us predict uh, what things are going to be like down the road? And uh, I'm sure these are questions that are active for, for many of you. And these are the sorts of questions that we hope <clears throat> our work will bring some data to uh, uh, over time um, to uh, help address. So for example, with regards to increasing awareness in practitioners that families go to, what we want to do is we really want to increase awareness of XY variations amongst clinicians and scientists and improve understanding of XY, uh, of development in XY variations and share this. So a lot of our work is focused on really describing um, cognitive uh, development and behavior in different groups with XY variations and publishing this work so that clinicians actually have something to go to and read that helps them tailor how they might assess a family they're meeting for the first time with an XY variation. And these questions about decision making, treatment, predicting the future, to try and address those we do work that tries to really more fully describe the full range of outcomes in individuals with XY variations and to identify uh, clinical factors that might predict outcomes. So for example, if we know that someone might have a particular type of cognitive difficulty, does that help us uh, um, more accurately predict if they're at risk for a particular type of mental health condition? Uh, and, and more data are need, needed to be able to answer these sorts of questions of parents, and those are the data that we're trying to gather in this study. And then finally, the why questions, the mechanistic questions, a large part of our work tries to define the brain and genetic changes that might actually be driving altered development in some people with XY variations. And ultimately, as you can imagine, um, if, we, if we were able to find specific mechanisms that are at play, then those would be an opportunity to develop specific treatments to support uh, development, uh, optimal development in individuals with XY variations. So those are some of the overarching goals of, of the work. Um, how do we go about addressing those goals? What does the study actually involve? And I'm going to approach this from two angles. I'm going to first approach it from what the study involves in terms of how the study is designed. And I wanted to take a bit of time to dig into why we do the study the way we do and how, it, how we hope it helps us ultimately address the questions that you have. And then also to address this question, what does the study involve? from the family's point of view, to walk you through what a typical uh, uh, participant might experience coming through the study. So what does a study involve in terms of scientific design? Well, the way we go about doing things is really informed by four key scientific motivations, four key approaches that we think are really important. I just wanted to flag these up uh, now. And again, please do butt in with questions at, at any time if you have them. Um, so the first uh, thing we think is really important is actually studying multiple XY variations alongside each other. 
So if we're in a given family, they'll be, they might be affected, they might have a child with XYY syndrome or uh, trisomy X or Kleinfelter's XXY syndrome. Um, and what we're finding is actually um, um, studying multiple conditions can help each other. What you learn about uh, trisomy X is actually very relevant for how you think about Kleinfelter syndrome. Uh, and I'm going to sort of unpack that uh, uh, in, in the next few points. So by studying multiple XY variations subtypes alongside each other, we get to clarify what sorts of problems are shared by multiple XY variation groups and which of them seem to be subgroup specific. Are there some difficulties that really tend to come along with having an extra Y chromosome, for example? and others that tend to come along with having an extra X chromosome. And knowing this helps you tailor your assessment of different children. For those shared issues that uh, seem to be uh, uh, present in multiple different subgroups, we can ask, is the, is the, um, the pathway to these issues? So for example, if you get to the risk pathway to having ADHD in someone with Kleinfelter syndrome compared to someone with trisomy X, are the same underlying processes at play? Or are you getting to, to the ADHD uh, endpoint, if you like, through different biological paths? And that's important to know if you want to tailor your treatment according to what XY variation your child has. But then there are these potential for subgroup specific issues. Uh, are there particular issues that we see most prominently in X, Y, Y, for example? And that's an important thing to determine because that gives you a big clue that, ah, actually it might be the Y chromosome specifically that's relevant for these, these issues that are most common in X, Y, Y. And again, that brings us to the mechanism question. So I want to kind of talk through an example of this, which comes from how we think about uh, the way genes and hormones might contribute to uh, development in individuals with trisomy X versus XXY syndrome. So in trisomy X, there's a presence of an extra X chromosome. And in XXY syndrome, there's a presence of an extra X chromosome in males. And that is accompanied by, um, by progressive uh, difficulties with uh, testicular function. So you have pretty much a pure change in chromosome dosage in trisomy X. And in XXY, you have a change in chromosome dosage with also some endocrine changes. And when we study these two conditions alongside each other, that can be very informative because if we see a particular difficulty occurring similarly in both trisomy X and XXY, it helps us understand that's probably about the X chromosome because that's the change that both of those conditions share. Whereas if you see some problems or difficulties that are more prevalent in XXY syndrome than triple X, you wonder, well, actually, maybe that's something more about the unique endocrine difficulties that we have in XXY that you don't see in trisomy X. So that, I hope that kind of uh, gives a concrete example of why um, studying multiple XY variations helps each individual one. The second principle that guides the study, and it's something we really um, uh, are careful to kind of talk through a lot with the families, is how we talk about differences and how we understand the variation in outcomes. So let me just orient you to this plot. So you can imagine this is the sort of uh, how a person is performing in a particular uh, test. Let's say their reading ability, they might, and this is the population average. So if you're up here, you might be above the population average in your reading ability. If a person scores down here, they might be below the population average. So it may be that on average in a given XY variation, for example, let's say individuals with XXY syndrome, they on average might score below the population average on a given task, let's say a reading skill, for example. But what's really important to, to appreciate is there is huge variation around that in each of the groups that we see. And typically, uh, in, in any one of the XY variation groups we see, even if the average score will be below the population average, there are some people that are scoring above the population average and some people that are more severely affected. So that's one really important thing to, 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 to sort of be aware of. And then the other thing that we uh, pay a lot of attention to is the fact that 
a given person might be below population average in one school, but actually above population average in another. And that's really important to understand, that an individual person can be differently affected in different aspects of behavior and cognition. And then finally, if we change task for time, a person may score below average in a given task at one point in their development, but that could shift over time. And the reason we think uh, to, to, to recognize the importance of this variation, we try to study large numbers of individuals so we can capture all the profiles of strength and weakness that are out there. Um, and then we also uh, aim to study people over time eventually too. So then the third um, uh, principle that informs what we do is to, we try to improve how we measure outcomes. Now this is a bit of a odd slide. Um, I just want to sort of explain uh, the, the, the utility of it, I think, or the significance of what we're talking about. When you want to understand how behavior, development, cognition can be altered in a particular condition, in a particular X, Y variation, it's really important that you're measuring behavior the right way uh, so that you're getting all of the uh, important information about how behavior is altered. And one way of thinking about that, a, 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 an analog of that is how you look at a picture. So this is a, this is a, is a pointillist picture. Uh, these dots of colors make up the face of a, of a man from the side. And, and if we looked at this picture focusing on an individual dot, uh, we'd see there's a brown dot here. But it's only when you look at the groups of dots, the patterns of dots together, that you see, ah, oh, actually, that's a mustache. And it's a little bit like that with behavior, that if we pick individual behavioral measures and pretend that they're not related to others, then we can actually miss information. And what we're discovering is if we really want to capture how behavior and development are impacted by X, Y variations, we need to study multiple dimensions of behavior at the same time, multiple questionnaires, multiple measures of different aspects of behavior, and see how these all hang together. So we can essentially find the mustaches, if you like. So we can find the meaningful sets of behaviors that seem to be impacted together. Um, and that's a key part of our work. And that requires gathering <clears throat> uh, lots of information from, from, sing from individual people. Uh, the fourth and um, final uh, um, aspect of what we do is we want to link up different levels. So we do a lot of work characterizing, as I've discussed, changes in behavior and cognition that can accompany XY variations. But our laboratory also, and, and as do some others, get detailed measures of brain structure and function and detailed measures of gene function. And ultimately, we want to understand how it is that the genetic changes in XY variation alter brain structure and function over development to put some people at risk for cognitive and behavioral difficulties and how that those processes interact with the environment and do so over developmental time. So um, we do analyses that try to link up measures of behavior with measures of brain, for example. Okay, so I've, I've spoken about these four uh, sort of guiding principles of the work, and that uh, dictates the sort of study we need to do to answer those questions. So we need measures from multiple XY variation groups to do the group comparison that I mentioned in point one. We need large numbers from each group, as I mentioned in point two, to capture the variation that you can see between individuals. Uh, the pointer list, that picture of the, the, the dotty picture of the man's face, uh, stressed the importance of gathering multiple measures together, considering multiple measures of behavior and cognition at the same time. So we need to make sure we, we gather those. And then to link up different levels, we need to get in the same people measures of, of, uh, of uh, gene function, measures of brain organization, and measures of behavior and cognition. So we can link the dots. And um, all of this informs the, the study design and the kind of data we gather. And I'm saying this as a context for the next slides, which are about the experience that participants have when they come through. This is an intentionally very busy uh, plot, but I just want to talk you through it. Each row is a group of individuals who we study with different doses of X and Y chromosomes. And this is the number of individuals that we're uh, hoping to get in each group. And each of these columns is a different measure that we gather uh, from those individuals. 
Some of them have to do with different aspects of behavior and cognition, autism spectrum disorder, uh, risk, risky behaviors, mood, cognition, um, physical exams, blood samples, and brain imaging. And what we're trying to do is to turn this whole block here green. So we've been working hard to, we've completed uh, uh, working with XYY families, and we've seen typically developing males and females, and we're currently uh, seeing XXY individuals. Um, and when this whole block is green, then we're able to address those comparisons between different XY variation groups. So this is the, the thinking behind how the study is designed. What does this mean as the experience of the participants who come through the study? And this is a typical participant visit. So this is actually a, an example from a recent uh, visit um, of a participant with XXY syndrome. And here we have additional measures of endocrine function. So it's typically a two day visit. Uh, the young person will come with their family. Um, and uh, at the beginning, there'll be a, a welcome session, admissions to the NIH Clinical Center, a completion of questionnaires, and a physical health check, and a detailed uh, assessment of uh, neuropsychological development, uh, puzzle solving, language skills, and an autism spectrum uh, evaluation in detail, a practice MRI scan, and then uh, neuropsychological testing of the young person and of the uh, uh, the, the relatives to, in this case the mother, then some lunch, and then tests uh, for um, bone density and bone age in the, in, in the, um, in the uh, young person, and then a detailed interview of the parent and a mental health, oops, and a mental health interview with the young person. And then on the second day, there'll be a, a full endocrine consult, uh, and then a physical exam with the nurse practitioner, the MRI scan to measure brain structure and function, and then uh, final sessions of cognitive testing and uh, mental health uh, assessments, interviews through the parents about the young person. So the way we get to filling in that, that matrix with green is to uh, work with the families through these two day visits. And I have to say, it is, it is a remarkable um, and incredibly humbling experience to see families come, uh, come to the, the unit from across the country and be part of these visits. They're, they're generally, I think, experienced as being uh, sort of rewarding, in, in, enjoyable visits. But as you can see from this timetable, they're also very busy. Uh, and this is just to say that the work that we do would be absolutely impossible um, if it wasn't for uh, families so generously giving their time and coming in and being part of a process like this. So it, 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 it's. Uh, um, we are sort of unspeakably uh, thankful, really. Um, but that just gives you a feeling for what it's like to be part of the study. So then the, what happens afterwards is there's a debrief meeting with a family before the end of the visit. And then all the clinical information that we've gathered over those two days is reviewed after the visit by a multidisciplinary team, clinicians. So we all come together, uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, uh, nursing staff and endocrine uh, specialists as needed and discuss the information that was gathered and use that to um, write a report that compiles the results of the neuropsychological testing, the autism assessment and the detailed mental health evaluation and then that's sent on to the families and um, our feedback uh, that we've received has been that those can be very useful in kind of accessing uh, care and promoting engaging engagement with services in uh, where they live. Um, so that's the sort of participant side of the uh, of the study. So so I've I've spoken a little bit about the background of the study, who's on the team, what we're trying to achieve, what the study involves from a scientific perspective, and what it involves from a sort of participant perspective. Uh, perspective. Um, the the second part of the the session is going to be digging into what some of the key outputs from our research have been, focusing on our findings regarding behavior and what our future plans are and how you can get more information. But let me pause for a moment and see if there are any, uh, any questions at all.
can't see any on the uh, chat screen right now, but but uh, so I think I'll just press on. But do um, do Ar jump. Armin, I'm I'm seeing a couple come in right now. Oh wow, <laughs> they're starting to flood in. Um, oh, I can't. Um, they're not showing. Now. Okay, then I'll I'll read a couple for you. Um, one is uh, the first uh, question was we agree with studying multiples alongside each other, but are curious as to why there continues to be so little research done on XXXY. NIH started the study a number of years ago on XXXY, but it was not completed. Is there something on the horizon? Yeah, that's a, that, that's a great question, and it partly relates to the um, the frequency of different XY variations. So. As many in the audience will will, will uh, you know know, there are certain X Y variations that tend to more often be the focus of scientific publications than others. So most work by far has been done on X X Y Klinefelter syndrome, and that partly reflects the uh, population level frequency of that condition relative to other X Y variations. So one of the issues with X X X Y is that it is relatively rarer. Than, than XXY. Uh, having said that, um, I think um, just for the reasons that, that we mentioned, there's real value in studying multiple conditions together and also focusing on each condition individually. So you can have a kind of useful reference paper that clinicians can go to. So to answer the question, we we are going to be recruiting with XXY syndrome uh, here. And that's going to be happening soon. So we're currently seeing XXY, and we anticipate towards the the um, uh, middle to latter half of this year, about the middle of this year, midsummer, we'll start to be uh, um, um, hoping to recruit individuals with XXXY, XXXXY uh, syndrome, XXYY. Um, so that's a, 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 a real plan for us. And then we we, we have uh, to date also published some uh, data on gene expression in XXY syndrome. So uh, that was a paper that included multiple XY variation groups that came out last year in the journal PNAS. And just to say, um, what what I thought we'd do is make sure that we send, we, we send some of our papers to Access for posting. But if there are any specific areas of interest, and I'll note this down now, I'll make sure to get all those papers to Access centrally so people can download them uh, download them, and if that would help, um, that would be wonderful. Because we're we've had a request, and we're working on trying to put together a brochure for uh, that condition. So thank you so much. Okay. Uh, another question. The next question is, um, I think, one a lot of parents would have. Does I understand why you need to look at large numbers to understand behavior and diversity of outcomes? But how do we as parents? take the information that you're gathering to help us figure out how to best parent and advocate for our own children? That is such a good question. Um, and and it's something that we grapple with uh, as clinicians and the scientists, because that's exactly right. What, what you want, to, the point we all want to get to is where an individual child can go into a clinic and you can have a tailored uh, Treat, assessment and treatment plan tailored specifically to that individual. So the idea of personalized uh, or pre precision medicine is really the, 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 the uh, sort of holy grail that we're all working towards. So that, that's the end point we want to get to. And the way I think ultimately, it's, it's a fair way down the path, but a necessary step towards that is to gather large enough samples that you're able to take multiple factors into account simultaneously. So I'll make it, I'll give a concrete example. What you want to be able to, for example, say is if I have a four-year-old who's got this level of cognitive development uh, and this level of difficulty with attention and they've been on this medication so far and they have this family history, what's the likelihood that down the road they're going to have depression, for example? And that is a kind of mathematical uh, question in a way that you need to make a statistical model that simultaneously can take into account all of those factors, age, which XY variation they have, what their cognitive development is, what their family history is. And 
for those models, for us to be able to make those models and make them accurate, we need to build them using very, very large samples. So in the, the, the so short answer is to get to a very precise statement about an individual, you need to start with observations from very, very large groups. Does that, does that answer the question? Um, thank you very much. Yes, I think that helps. Um, two people asked um, questions about how close are you to finishing the X, X, Y portion of the study, and when would you expect to see those published, those results published? Um, so, based on our current projections, we so we're we're hoping to uh, um, to see about a hundred uh, individuals and families. Uh, to expand the sample size for the reasons I mentioned. And we estimate based on current predictions that we'd be there by about uh, the, the about June this year. Um, so within about six months. Um, and the first papers after we finished seeing the participants with XXY syndrome will be characterizing behavior and cognition. And we'd hope to have those out by the end of the calendar year. Um, so, obviously, when we gather uh, the sorts of data that I've described, we need to be very planful about how we prioritize which parts of the data we analyze first. And I think for us, the, the sort of top priority is always going to be these behavioral uh, uh, papers that we can get out there to hopefully kind of raise the level of, of, of public awareness. So those will be the first publications that come out. Um, thank you. One person asked about um, how do these results make their way to the policymakers, and what can we expect? Yeah, it, it's it's an interesting thing. I mean, I think um, one of the things that really strikes me, and I know it strikes others working in the field, is there seems to be this um, mismatch between how collectively common XY variations are and how much tension they get from the clinical and the research community. It sort of seems that they, in some sectors they're a bit over overlooked, if you like. So, um, and I think part of that might stem from early studies that um, were trying to estimate how um, severe or how on average uh, impaired or impacted uh, individuals can be if they have XY variations. And those older studies were done on very small samples and they weren't measuring behavior in a very detailed way. So they may have sort of failed to capture the full range of need that one can find in individuals affected with XY variation. That's not to say that all individuals who have these conditions have severe difficulties but some certainly do. And that message, I think, has been lost a little bit. So um, the, the, in addition to writing these individual papers, I think what the, what the research community really needs to try to do is also write kind of position papers where we specifically advertise, if you like, for example, to the mental health research community why it's important to study XY variations. Um, and those, I think, are the first steps to shaping policy by using data to, to raise the awareness of professional groups and to be able to have them join families in, in advocating for uh, greater, greater funding and uh, attention on XY variations. Thank you. There's uh, several questions about how M people can sign up for this study. And who is eligible? Would a, for example, a 50-year-old man be eligible? And somebody who was um, told they couldn't participate because their son was born premature. So, could you perhaps comment a little bit about how people could get involved in the study and who is eligible? Absolutely, absolutely. At the end of the uh, uh, presentation, I have a, a contact slide. So, uh, the key contact point would be Jonathan Blumenthal, the research coordinator. Uh, and we can uh, we have details in the presentation. We can provide them uh, to you for distribution. I think you also kindly uh, advertised the posted the study on the Access website. And then, <coughs> if anyone's interested or has any questions, we can have a one-on-one -on -one discussion then to 
um, discuss uh, what the study is about and, and, and eligibility. The, the uh, question you raised about age, we, our study age range is focused on 5 to 25. And thank you. And yes, we do. Um, Access is very proud to support all the researchers that are doing studies in these areas. So please check our website. We do our best to list as many of those studies as we can once we've vetted them. And we also will put them on our social media, our Facebook pages, our Instagram, and also send them out in the e -box. And we just, uh, Jonathan asked us to do that very recently and, and Rick sent that out. So. That's the majority of the questions now. If you want to return to your uh, the rest of your presentation, and we'll get some more questions later. Okay, thank you. Okay. <coughs> so um, we've spoken about the context of the study and the study team, what we're trying to achieve, and and how we've been trying to achieve it, and what the experience is like for families. So what about the outputs? What have we actually sort of found from the study? Um, as I mentioned, um, a key part of our study design is we, we um, examine or uh, we work with uh, XY variations at, very, at multiple different levels. So at levels of uh, gene function, at levels of brain organization, and at levels of cognition and behavior. What I've done here is just listed a few studies that have come out in the last uh, a couple of years at each of these levels. So we recently published a study that mapped in fine detail how gene expression is altered in cells from participants with XY variations. And that's been a big, that's a very fundamental question, but there wasn't sort of much data to address that question. And the reasoning is that presumably many of the difficulties that can arise in some people with XY variations ultimately have to do with how when cells are carrying an extra X and a Y chromosome, it changes the way the genome functions. But we knew very little about what those changes are. So that's an example of the study. These studies here are characterizing XY variation effects on the nucleus of cells. We've also done a series of studies that try to um, map which brain regions seem to be most sensitive uh, in XY variations, which ones might be most uh, quickly or most uh, 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 tend most to be altered. And those we think are reflective of the genetic effects. And we think that those brain systems might be the ones that are underlying some of the behavioral and cognitive difficulties that we've been mentioning. Uh, and that's been something that we've also focused on um, uh, characterizing altered behavior and cognition or patterns of behavioral cognition. What I thought I'd do today is not focus really on the genetic level of analysis or the brain imaging level of analysis, but dive deep into the behavior and cognition um, and focus on, a, on some recent studies that have come out. As I said, we can make all of the other studies available and I'd be more than happy to answer questions at the genetic and at the brain level. Um, but maybe for now, um, I'll, I'll move on to the slides about behavior and cognition. Um, so, as I said, I'm a, I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist, and uh, one of the, uh, although we, we, we're interested in how X and Y variations influence cognition, uh, we're also interested in, in how risk for mental health uh, conditions might be increased in individuals with X, Y variations. So what I'm showing you here are the three studies that exist that measure rates of uh, mental health diagnoses in XY variation groups um, using uh, what's called a gold standard instrument. So what these studies do is they each have these very lo long questionnaires that are administered by a trained mental health professional. It's a sort of two hour interview with the young person and with the young person's carers too. And that's used to generate uh, very precise statements about whether that young person has at any point had depression, for example, or ADHD. Um, and it's notable, uh, given the question that just came up, how few studies there are, right? There are only three. Uh, so that, the fact that there are only three really emphasizes why there needs to be more, more work in this, in this space. But let me walk you through them. This was a study um, on um, uh, trisomy X individuals. This was a study on 51 uh, males with Kleinfelder syndrome. 
And these are some early findings uh, that we're working to write up uh, on a cohort of 65 uh, XYY males that we uh, uh, just finished uh, seeing. And what I'm showing you here is the percentage of this group of individuals who have each diagnosis. So 27% of X, XY individuals met criteria for autism spectrum disorder diagnosis in this study by Bruning. 14% uh, of these 65 individuals met diagnostic criteria for uh, autism spectrum disorder in our, in our recent study. 15% um, ticks. Um, and then I'll, you can see the other percentages here. So there are a few things to note. The comparison here is the rate of mental health difficulties in the general population. And, and um, um, almost all of these um, estimates are somewhat higher than they would be in the general population. That's one thing to note. Um, but not uh, always dramatically higher. Um, the second thing to note is the, the rate of, of the of conditions varies across groups. So there were no, no uh, uh, individuals in this group of 35 that had autism, whereas a third of this group met criteria for autism. What that's telling you is that it's not the case that all XY variations put you at the same sort of risk for mental health difficulties. It depends whether you have an X or it seems to depend whether you have an X or a Y variation and whether you're a male or a female for some conditions. So here it seems that having an XY variation influences risk of autism most strongly if you're a male, but not so strongly if you're a female. That the impact it has on risk for autism differs depending on whether you have an extra X or whether you have an extra Y. In contrast, if we look at ADHD, the rates are similarly high um, whether you have an extra X or an extra Y. Um, so there's not a, a difference between the chromosome here. And if we look at anxiety disorders, having an extra X chromosome is associated with a significantly high rate of anxiety disorder where it occurs in females, but a, but a, le but a more modest elevation in, in the rate of anxiety disorders in males with an extra X. So these, these are small studies and they need to be uh, extended into larger groups and reassessed using different measures of behavior. But they give some evidence of why you really need to drill into different groups separately. You can't generalize from one XY variation to the other. And we think these data are useful because what we hope is that as they get more uh, visible in the general community, when a family goes to see a practitioner, there'll be a paper out there that the practitioner will be aware of, and they'll know, oh, wow, uh, in, you know, up to, to two thirds of individuals with this condition might have ADHD, so I need to be very careful in assessing for the presence of that. So having said that, I've just uh, described the diagnosis, but I want to highlight a few really important things. One is that the presence or absence of a diagnosis is only so meaningful. Many of the individuals we see have partial features of a diagnosis, but not full features. So if you need 10 symptoms, for example, to have a diagnosis of ADHD, they have six. And uh, having six can still be meaningful because it causes difficulties, for example, in the classroom, even though you don't have quite enough to fully meet the criteria for ADHD. So sub-threshold symptoms are common they're important for how people function in the real world, but they're missed if all you are measuring is whether someone has a full diagnosis or not, that's the first thing to say. The second thing to say is that we often see young people coming in who have a few symptoms from multiple different diagnoses. So what this means is that all of us um, are more complicated than the psychiatric sort of textbooks say, if you like. It's not that we come in boxes, whether we either have depression or nothing else. Um, there are often most more common than not, features of different mental health difficulties can sometimes be mixed. And that's really important to know about when you're wanting to support someone's development. And again, that's not captured if you're just looking at individual diagnoses. And also these are popular, these are averages across the group. Uh, this is not to say that um, uh, they apply to everyone. So there's huge variability between people within with any given XY variation subtype. 
Now, what I want to do to unpack some of these uh, issues and considerations is focus on uh, some recent findings in a study that uh, we did in collaboration with Audrey Thurm's group here at the NIMH that characterized <clears throat> autism spectrum disorder and neurodevelopmental profiles in youth with XYY syndrome. I want to stress that although the data I'm going to present um, are from a uh, cohort with XYY syndrome, the sorts of analyses we're doing and the sorts of questions they raise are really um, uh, important for how we think about all XY variations. So this is a kind of example of how I think it's important to approach uh, the study of behavior and cognition and what sorts of questions it's important to ask. Um, and that have meaning for families, and I think they have meaning for clinicians and how we think about the biology of these conditions too. So one important question that we're focusing on is, can we find areas of relative strength and difficulty in a given XY variation? What we want to know is which parts of behavior and cognition seem to be most affected and which parts seem to be relatively resilient. Um, relatively insensitive to XY variation because that gives you a sense of how each condition is influencing different aspects of development. So let me walk you through this, this plot. Each of these rows is a different measure of uh, cognition and functioning. This is nonverbal IQ, so puzzle solving. This is performance in, in scholastic tests of writing, of math. This is uh, verbal IQ, so verbal reasoning. This is uh, tests of reading ability. This is uh, daily living and sort of self-care skills, communication skills, and social interaction, uh, social functioning skills. This vertical line here is the population average. So if you went into the general population and you um, applied these scales to a large number of people, they're set up so that the, the average score would be, would be uh, 100. So half of the people you'd see would score less than 100, half would score uh, more than 100, and the vast majority of people would be somewhere within this sort of 80 to 120 range. Um, these are the distributions of scores that we observed in the 65 individuals of XYY syndrome. This is the average score. Um, this is the, the sort of bulk of individuals, and then this is the full range. So a number of really important messages from here that you'd only get if you compare multiple aspects of behavior, uh, multiple aspects of cognition alongside each other. The most impacted score was socialization, then communication, uh, then daily living, then reading. So there's a sort of graded effect. So there's relative strength in nonverbal IQ as compared to uh, socialization and, and verbal IQ, for example. That's one thing to say. So some areas are relatively protected and others you need to be more uh, careful in looking out for, for difficulties in. The second thing to say is that um, there are very, very wide scores. So if we look at verbal IQ, some people here have a score of 50 and they had some people with a score of 120, which is sort of above average. And that's really important because what that means is it's very hard to tell if all you know is that someone has XYY syndrome, how they're going to do. And on average, XYY individuals with XYY syndrome may have more difficulties in reading, for example, than the general population. But that doesn't mean that every individual with XYY syndrome will do. Some will be more severely infected and some less. And then the other thing to say is that this profile is a population average. There will be some people with XYY syndrome who are actually uh, better in their verbal uh, performance than in their nonverbal performance. But this is a population average. The second question we can ask, and I think it's really important to ask, and it comes back to this question about policy and impact, is could it be that the profiles we observe um, as being impacted um, in XY variations have to do with the fact that we're seeing people who, by definition, already know they have uh, an XY variation. So if we think about this in the context of XYY syndrome, this is called ascertainment bias, this idea. So you can think of 
if we think of all the XYY individuals born in the States, a subgroup of those individuals know they have XYY syndrome. It's estimated that perhaps over 50% of individuals born with XYY syndrome will never know that they, they, they have it. So only half of the individuals, let's say, know they have it. And that's often because something has happened for them to be tested um, or they've been tested diagnosed prenatally. And then of that sample, not everyone who knows they have an XYY diagnosis comes into our study or into studies in general. And it may be that of all the people who know they have XYY, perhaps it could potentially be the, more, the individuals who are more worried about uh, their children's development might come into a study. So if you have this sort of process and you measure cognition and behavior in individuals who were born with XYY, got diagnosed and came into a study, you may be looking at a more kind of severe end of the picture that may, be, may give a, a, a picture of greater impairment than if you were measuring impairment in all individuals born. So we need to be very wary of the possibility for ascertainment bias. And what that means is we want to be careful that when we publish a study that says the average uh, IQ, for example, in XYY syndrome is X, that we need to know how likely is it that that's really representative of the whole population? Or could it be that we, is there, are there any clues that suggest we're seeing the more severe end of things? And we try to get at this question with XY, in XYY syndrome, and we will also get at the same question in all the other syndromes we see. You, by comparing people who are diagnosed prenatally with people who are diagnosed postnatally. Now, let me walk you through this plot. Again, each row is a different test of uh, cognition, uh, full scale, glo global cognitive ability, verbal ability, puzzle solving, processing speed, working memory, uh, visual, spatial, again, sort of puzzle solving, tests of um, maths, writing and reading, and the daily functioning scores that I mentioned. This is the same scale, so the population average, I should have a vertical line here, I apologize, is 100. And this is, the, these individuals who score here would be above average in their ability, and individuals who score here would be below average in their ability. And these curves show the distribution of scores that we saw for each of these two subgroups. So you can see, for example, in full scale IQ, most people uh, who were born prenatally, the average full-scale IQ was, oops, I apologize, was, was around, let's say, 95. But the distribution here was shifted to the left in people who were diagnosed postnatally. So the levels of cognitive functioning that you see in the postnatally diagnosed group tend to be a little bit uh, more severely impacted than in the prenatally diagnosed group. And if you look across all of these tests, you tend to see milder impact in the individuals diagnosed prenatally than the individuals diagnosed postnatally. Now, this doesn't mean that being diagnosed prenatally is making, this doesn't necessarily mean that being diagnosed prenatally uh, causes you to have a less severe set of problems. We think what this means is that when you get diagnosed with XYY postnatally, because there aren't many physical features of XYY syndrome, it's commonly because the child has a difficulty with development or has a difficulty with mental health. They go and see a practitioner, they get a test, and they get found out to have XYY. So the reason they're diagnosed postnatally is that they had a cognitive and behavioral difficulty that got them diagnosed. Increasingly, individuals are being diagnosed with XYY and other XY variations prenatally through non-invasive prenatal testing. And if you're diagnosed while you're in the womb, it's impossible for you to be diagnosed because you have a behavioral difficulty, you're, you're in utero still. So when we see a split, when we see a big difference between the performance, the, the scores in prenatal versus postnatally diagnosed individuals, it's giving us a hint that maybe there's some ascertainment bias within, um, within studies. So you need to be careful not to generalize what you find in the postnatally diagnosed groups to all individuals. And you'll see in some, in some uh, areas, the, the bias is more than in others. There's more of a gap between the pink and the, and, and the blue. 
Um, so we think this is really important because we're trying to do study designs that, that, that limit the degree of ascertainment bias. This is a complex plot, but, our, but it's, but it's in, intuitive to sort of understand. I'll just walk you through it. This has to do with using variation uh, between different people with an XY variation to identify sets of behaviors that hang, to, hang together. So each of these dots is a, give, is a different measure of behavior. This is, for example, um, uh, continuous measure of autistic symptoms. This is uh, your age, your first word. This is your score on a, a, a scale that measures your maths ability. And the lines between these different tests uh, indicate um, how similar the level of impairment in one test is to the level of impairment in another across individuals. So what this sort of network analysis does is it finds clumps of tests that all seem to behave the same way. What this says is that if you know someone tends to be doing very well on their non-verbal IQ, their puzzle solving, that gives you a fair bit of information about how they're doing in their language test, because these all hang together. But it gives you less information about how they're doing in their social interaction, for example. And we think this is really important because it helps us, instead of measuring each of these behaviors separately, we measure them as groups, and that gives us a more accurate impression of how behavior and cognition are altered in XYY syndrome. So finally, uh, looking forward, uh, what are our future plans? Uh, we, have, we have many, but I'm just, again, prioritizing the ones that relate to uh, behavior here and active recruitment. So ongoing participant recruitment, as I mentioned, we want to finish uh, the ongoing recruitment of individuals with XXY syndrome start to see other more rare male variations, XXYY, uh, uh, XXXY, and XXXXY. And then finally, we'll be moving on to see um, females with XY variations, trisomy X and um, uh, XXXX groups. As I mentioned earlier, um, a priority is for us to uh, put out clinical reports that detail uh, cognitive and behavioral features in each XY group, and then to uh, move on to studies that compare different XY groups. Um, and then we want to try to test if the different sets of cognitive and behavioral difficulties can be linked to different brain regions. And then we want to test um, how it is that XY variations can target those specific brain systems. And then ultimately, the goal is to use these genetic and brain imaging findings. This is the middle to longer term goal. Once we find these brain regions that have seemed to be most sensitive and link them to the genetic changes, the question is, can we use measures of gene function and brain imaging in individuals with XY variations to try and help us better predict uh, what sorts of difficulties they're going to have down the line? Uh, or what sort of strengths they might have to help us kind of um, see the future, I guess, um, and to tailor treatments. That, that's the ultimate kind of goal. And that comes back to the excellent question that we had in the middle question session. How is this work going to ultimately lead to me going into a clinic with my child and getting better treatment? Uh, so um, how can I get more information? Um, as I mentioned, the key... Uh, Point, contact point is John from Blumenthal, the research coordinator, and there's the excellent uh, um, uh, um, range of studies uh, advertised on the Access uh, uh, website, as, as Carol mentioned. Um, and then finally, I uh, really want to open it up in the remaining time we have left to any other questions you'd like to ask uh, or points of clarification. Um, but before we do that, I really want to highlight uh, you all. Um, and the community for taking part in this study uh, and making it possible. It's a real partnership. And to also thank all of the uh, researchers within uh, my group, uh, within the wider NIH, and collaborators in uh, the States, Canada, and Europe for, for joining us in, in these uh, efforts that I've just been um, outlining, um, which I think I'll just emphasize you know, the ultimate goal is to improve care that there is a, a difficult path towards that, but I think we're making steps in the right direction. Thank you very much for, for your attention and happy to take any questions.
Well, a couple of questions have come in, so everyone, please continue to type your questions in. Uh, one person asked about, um, did you ever think about sharing the info and um, advocating for newborn screening for XY variations in all the states? Yeah, that's a really, um, that's a sort of controversial, uh, controversial issue. The, um, the scientist, um, uh, uh, I'm just going to pop back to the fly here in case people are The scientist in me uh, thinks that would be an excellent step because it's really the only way of making sure we get a truly accurate picture of how common XY variations are and how what proportion of people with XY variations have difficulties in, say, cognition and behavior. That's difficult to do in the states in particular because of the way uh, healthcare systems are structured. And there's also a number of kind of ethical concerns. Interestingly, just before the talk uh, began, um, Carol and I were talking about uh, a trip that I recently made to Denmark, learn more about the work they're doing there, which is exactly that, that they are taking advantage of the ability to systematically screen um, a consecutive series of newborns uh, to be able to get accurate estimates of the incidents and, and the consequences for development. So we're excited to have uh, the prospect of working more closely with colleagues in Denmark um, who are leading this work to try and um, fill in those gaps in our understanding. It, unfortunately, it's hard to achieve, I think, in, in, in the US, but that could change if, if a strong case can be made. Thank you. And there's another question asking, will the study look at mosaic XXY or, and, or perhaps you can just comment a little bit more on those who are on um, mosaic? Yeah. So uh, uh, for those who, who um, aren't familiar with the, with the idea of mosaicism, it is that uh, not all of the cells in one individual can have the same XY variation. It may be that an individual has some cells that don't have an XY variation and some cells that do, or actually different sets of cells that have different types of XY variation. That has to do with um, how the body develops and at what stage in, um, in uh, conception or development the XY variation can develop. Uh, so we test for mosaicism by doing a blood draw and looking at a large number of blood cells and counting how many look like they have a full the full XY variation and, and are there any that don't. Um, that's a limited test for mosaicism because it only tells you in blood, but obviously it's not possible in living individuals to systematically test every cell in the body. We to date have focused on individuals without mosaic XY variations as, as far as we can tell from blood. And the reason for that is um, Obviously, ultimately, one would want to include all subtypes, but we want to be able to be as sure as we can about the uh, estimates we're, we're making of changes in cognition, changes in brain, for example. And if you include individuals with mosaicism, that can further increase the variance, the spread that I discussed, and make it harder for us to statistically detect the kind of signals we need to do this research. So, the initial step we think um, that, we, that we need to take is to focus on the simpler scenario uh, and more common scenario, I think, of non-mosaicism, understand what's happening there, and then use that as a springboard to move into more complex situations where there is mosaicism. Thank you. The next comment is, um, I would think the early prenatal diagnosis gets the parents the ability to get early intervention. So do you feel that that is uh, part of the results of this study, the change of having early intervention? Yeah, that's another, that, that's another hypothesis. So that's consistent with the data. Uh, that, that would be consistent with the data. But um, so it's, it's certainly conceivable uh, we haven't got the kind of study designs we need to uh, to address that question. So um, to date, there's already some evidence for ascertainment bias. So there are prior data supporting that interpretation, but it could also be that some of the differences that we're seeing between the pre and postnatally diagnosed 
may have to do with differential interventions. And we just don't, we just don't know yet. Um, I think what's great is that uh, really excited to hear that uh, Nicole Tartaglia, Dr. T, as many of you, as many of you know her, has uh, together with collaborators been funded to uh, do some detailed uh, studies in prenatally diagnosed individuals, and that's exactly what we need more broadly, but also to specifically answer this question about the impact of intervention. It's a great question, and I think it's going to become a bigger part of our discussion about XY variations as the fraction of people who are known to have them who have been diagnosed prenatally is likely to go up in the future. So I think that's going to change the landscape down the line. Thank you. There's another question. It says, you stated that you also gather information about behaviors within the families. How much connection are you finding with hereditary traits? Again, a, a great question. And that's something we're, we're, we're um, hoping to analyze soon. So we're entering the data and checking it all now. As I said, in the X, Y, Y part, the first uh, part, the, the only full cohort that we have the information on the affected individual and the family member is the, co the completed cohort of X, Y, Y individuals that we saw before we started the X, X, Y phase. So they're the only ones we can do it in right now. And that's something we're hoping to do very soon. There's some data from uh, David Ledbetter's group at Geisinger that, suge <coughs> that suggests that one of the factors that might explain inter-individual variation amongst people who have a given XY variation has to do with inter-individual variation amongst their families. So to give another, another example, if you have a genetic condition that makes you on average shorter, there'll be some variation. Some people with that genetic condition will be particularly short and some people won't be so short. And that that variation may have to do with how tall your parents are. So the genetic and environmental background that, the gen that, that uh, say, the XY variation is occurring on. So you can think of a curve being shifted to the left, if you like. Uh, so we're looking into that right now, but I'm afraid I don't have, a, I don't have an answer yet. And there were several comments that just thank you, that really appreciate you being here. Uh, people appreciate it. Definitely going in depth. Many of our families are very well educated um, about these conditions, and they really appreciate the researchers coming, going in depth, and they said they hope you do it again. Oh, that's that's really kind of people to say, and I, and I hope it was uh, accessible and useful. I, it, I, it's always, I, I wasn't sure it's sort of... Uh, how how deep to go, but um, uh, I'm glad uh, that uh, that people found it helpful, and, and thank you very much for inviting me. Oh, and we're really happy you're here. And uh, several people are saying they're looking forward to reading the research paper. So when you send them along, we do post them, and people do read them. I have another question that asks: Is there any research about how these variations occur during conception? What makes the X sticky in XXY? What makes the X sticky? Like, how does this happen? How, yeah, how yeah, is that? yeah, it's a great question. That there are different, there are different routes to it happening. Uh, there are sort of three main pathways, and they have to do with um, when in um, formation of the the gametes, the X and the sort of paired X chromosomes fail to separate from each other. So there's some there's some research on that. Um, one of the opportunities in these uh, upcoming studies that I mentioned is to test if different routes to having a child with an XY variation can be predicted by different parental factors. Um, so this is not something that our research focuses on uh, in particular, the sort of reproductive aspects of uh, arriving at an XY variation, but there are some good reviews uh, out there on that topic, which I could also uh, forward along if, if that's of interest. Um, that would be appreciated. There's another question that asks is if part of your study gathers uh, learning about therapies, you know, either behavioral or pharmacological to help minimize the impact, or if it's not your study, are there other studies that you know of that are doing that? Um, so we, we don't uh, we don't um, administer uh, we don't do research trials where 
we take some participants and give them a treatment and others we don't. We systematically record in, uh, we gather information about what treatments the people who come through our study have received. Uh, but those aren't, um, that's observational. And if I understand the, 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 uh, the uh, question correctly, it's about systematic research that's trying to determine which treatments uh, work better than others, for example. Um, so randomized controlled trials, that's not something that we do. And I think in general, it's a question that comes up quite often is, you know, um, how should, uh, given my child has an XY variation, for example, how should their ADHD be treated? And unfortunately, the truth is that there aren't sort of studies out there that test if are the treatments for ADHD in individuals with XY variation, do we need to tweak them as compared to the way we're treating ADHD in individuals without XY variation? Uh, it's an important question, but those sort of studies haven't been done. And it partly has to do with the great difficulty of doing these sorts of clinical trials where you're testing different treatments and the challenges in doing them in, very, in, in smaller, rarer genetic groups. And so my general advice to people is that the most important thing is to <clears throat> get a thorough assessment, to get that done uh, as soon as you start to have concerns, and to promote and advocate for access to uh, the gold standard treatment for that difficulty, if it's ADHD, if it's autism spectrum disorder, if it's, uh, uh, if it's Tourette's, um, to sort of treat the uh, behavioral um, manifestations um, irrespective of whether they're occurring in the background of a particular aneuploidy or not. <clears throat> and I think this is the last question, is an interesting one, uh, and there might be one more. Uh, is, has the government shutdown affected enrollment in the study? Uh, so, and no, it hasn't actually. That's a, that's a, the NIH already appropriations had already come through. So unlike the FDA, we're not we're not shut down. And another person asked about having children that are adopted. Are they eligible to be in this study? Yes. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, and uh, we really appreciate you sharing your expertise and this research with us. And thanks to all of you um, in the audience who attended and for your fantastic questions. And I hope to see you all in Atlanta at our conference. Thank you. See you all in Atlanta. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye.